Hello, um, this is a video intended mostly for um, students or physicists, people who has studied thermodynamics or is studying thermodynamics, but it is not understanding completely the, the matter. And I think one of the problems of uh, many textbooks and many courses on thermodynamics is that they are based on the first law and the second law. So this is a kind, this is a historical approach. But nowadays it doesn't make so sense. Or we can present thermodynamics in a more coherent way. And actually, the problem with the historical approach is also that it 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 uh, mixes two different tasks the two tasks that uh, equilibrium thermodynamics tries to address. And it's important to distinguish between these two uh, different problems. The first one is to characterize equilibrium states. So the characterization of equilibrium states. And the second one is the characterization or the analysis of the energetics of processes, or in particular in equilibrium thermodynamics of quasi-static processes, where the system is in equilibrium at any stage of the process. So you can see that if you don't solve the first task, it's difficult to address the second one. So the first one is more basic than the second one. And the problem is that with this historical approach, this historical approach is based on processes. If you think of the first law of thermodynamics, it tells us that the change of energy in a process is equal to the heat and heat plus work. Heat and work are concepts uh, which only make sense when you talk about processes. And the second law, well, the second law um, has different statements, but the, uh, let's say the, the most celebrated ones, for instance, is the Kelvin-Planck statement, which tells us also that it is impossible to extract work from a single thermal bath in a process. So uh, it is, uh, this is why nobody understands thermodynamics. This is a bit exaggeration, but I think it's, it's, uh, it's, it's partly true at least. And it's because uh, the, the standard approach, the historical approach is uh, missing this important um, and basic task of thermodynamics, which is the characterization of equilibrium states. And, um, uh, this is sometimes just uh, assume like that people know the equation of ideal gases and things like that. Equations of states. This is essentially the this uh, the, uh, uh, trying to derive um, equations of states. An important exception which introduces thermodynamics uh, distinguishing between these two tasks is the book by Kallen that some of you uh, maybe know. And also uh, in chemical physics, in the books of chemical physics, you can see uh, um, uh, presentations of thermodynamics, which really uh, highlight the importance of this first task. But in physics, as I said, in, in many books, they are based on this first and second law, which are, as I said, they, they, they deal with processes and processes are uh, kind of secondary task if you like. So uh, let's try to introduce the main concepts of thermodynamics by uh, trying to solve the first problem. What is the equilibrium state in a system? First, what is equilibrium? Here there are a lot of also subtleties and uh, the, the purpose of this video is not to discuss all these subtleties, but that's just give a kind of overview a very brief uh, overview of, of the main concepts of thermodynamics, but uh, all these concepts have uh, a lot of subtleties because thermodynamics is, at the end of the day, a theoretical framework that contains a lot of idealization. Anyway, one of the basic assumptions of thermodynamics is the existence of equilibrium states, which means that if you have an isolated system and you let it evolve, it will reach some state we call it equilibrium because the idea is that um, the macroscopic variables of uh, this state don't change in time. And of course, here there is also a question, a fundamental question of what is a macroscopic variable. Is it possible to define in an objective way 
uh, macroscopic variables or it is just a question of our technology or our, our viewpoint. Uh, as I said, we are not going to address these questions, but let me just uh, assume that there are uh, um, equilibrium states for isolated systems. So the problem of thermodynamics or the basic problem of thermodynamics is to characterize these equilibrium states, which means characterize means that um, the um, the system will have um, some magnitudes, macroscopic magnitudes, and these magnitudes can uh, take on different values. And the problem is to find the equilibrium or the values of these magnitudes at equilibrium. Or if, if I let the system above, these variables will change in time and it, they will reach a constant value for long times and this is the equilibrium values so what uh, how uh, so how thermodynamics uh, addresses this problem well the idea is to postulate the existence of a function which is the entropy such that uh, it's going to be maximum uh, in equilibrium so it will allow us to uh, find these equilibrium values. Let me uh, list the main properties of this function, the entropy. First, it's a function of the macrostate of the system, which uh, is described by some magnitudes. Uh, let's say some macroscopic variables. I call them variables because they can change. If I let the system evolve, they can change. So. Um, these are macroscopic variables and then some parameters which are fixed maybe if I have a gas it could be the volume uh, an external magnetic field or gravitational field and so on and among these fixed parameters we have the energy because the system is isolated and the energy is fixed so it is a, a magnitude that um, characterizes this macroscopic state so why the entropy solves the problem of characterizing equilibrium because we also postulate that this uh, function is maximum at equilibrium. So the postulate is that there exists a function of my macro state, and this function is maximum at equilibrium, which means that I can solve the main problem. The main problem, remember, is to find the value at equilibrium of these macroscopic variables. I can solve it by maximizing the entropy and the arguments, these are max, mean the arguments that maximize the function S. These are the equilibrium values of my variables. So this is the solution of the first task of thermodynamics. But of course, it's not really a solution. It's just to code, let's say, the problem in the mathematical terms, in, in a mathematical function, which is the entropy. But uh, to solve the problem, we need to know uh, the entropy of a system or at least some of the properties, mathematical properties of this function. The amazing thing is that with just a few assumptions on the entropy, we can derive a lot of consequences. And um, the main assumption or the most basic assumption is the following, that the entropy is additive. If I have a system that is composed by two systems, one and two, the entropy of the global system is just the sum. This is true. If uh, when you go to statistical mechanics and you uh, formal, I mean, and, and you give a microscopic interpretation to this entropy, this is true only if the systems are weakly coupled. If the energy, uh, if the interaction between the two systems carries uh, um, not so much energy or less and en much less energy, and negligible, or when the uh, interaction between the two systems. Uh, contains an energy which is negligible uh, compared with the energy of each of the two systems. So these are the three, this is the postulate, let's say, that solves the first problem or at least uh, will give us a lot of information about the first problem of characterizing equilibrium. And, and as I, I, I insist that there are a lot of subtleties like how to define in an objective way macroscopic variables, and uh, and for instance, also when the entropy is additive or not. But in this video, we will just uh, give this brief introduction, which uh, assumes all these idealizations uh, which are inherent to thermodynamics. 
And uh, as I said, the, the nice thing is that uh, just with uh, these um, two very mild assumptions, we can extract uh, some information even without knowing the 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 specific form of this entropy and i will show you this with an example which is um, two systems exchanging energy so uh, let me call system one system two here i sketch the two systems in this picture it is not necessary that uh, they are spatially separated. For instance, here we have uh, there is here, there is air here. For instance, in the in the air here, we could think of system one as the molecules of oxygen and system two the molecules of nitrogen. This would be uh, two systems exchanging energy because there are collisions between oxygen and, and nitrogen molecules and they share the same volume so so let us sketch it like that and they can exchange energy and this means that the energy of system one is uh, variable so if i let the system evolve uh, e1 which is the energy of system one can change and e2 can also change and actually if i consider that the rest of the systems are uh, i mean there are no changes in in in, in the internal structure of the system this is the only thing that that changes this is the only variable of the system and actually it's just a single variable because the total energy is constant the system is isolated so the total energy is constant so they they, they are only a single variable in the system which is e1 because e2 is uh is given by e1 and, and the total energy so then i have my entropy so i have my entropy and I can use additivity. So it would be the entropy of system one and system two, and I will assume that the entropies depend on the energy. Well, the, the, entro the entropies depend on the variables or and the parameters. So, so the entropy of system one will depend on energy one, and the entropy of system two will depend on energy two. And here, as I said before, this is the only variable is E1. E total is a fixed parameter, and here I've used uh, uh, additivity so it is just an example of the three uh, let's say um, assumptions that we had in the previous uh, blackboard so now we can use the 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 uh, main property of uh, of uh, entropy which is that it is maximum at equilibrium uh, well one way of uh, to to maximize so we have to maximize this function and the value of E1 that maximizes the function, this is the equilibrium value, which we call it like that. If the function is uh, regular, uh, yeah, it will the derivative will vanish in the maximum. Of course, we have to also check if it is a maximum or a minimum and so on. But let's say that the equilibrium value of uh, E1 will uh, obey this equation. So this is a mathematical equation that if we know everything, we can solve this equation and characterize and find the equilibrium state which is what is the value of e1 so let's uh, uh, use the expression that we have here based on additivity and uh, let's uh, calculate the derivative the derivative is the derivative of the sum so it's the derivative the derivative of the first term in the sum which is this one and then the derivative of the second term the derivative of the second term so here e1 is inside is in the argument of the function so we have to apply the the chain rule we the differentiate s2 with respect to its argument let's call it e2 which here is a dummy variable and then we have to uh, calculate the derivative of the argument with respect to e1 which is just minus one okay this is the derivative of the total entropy with respect to the um, uh, uh, e1 and this must be equal to zero and now this equation if i take these terms to the right hand side of the equation i get that the equilibrium condition which is this one or that the e1 equilibrium the energy e1 at equilibrium must obey this equation 
it looks like we have not uh, progressed uh, too much. But uh, if you think of this equation, this equation has a very nice property. And it is like it is a, an equation and the left hand side depends only on system one. Whereas the right hand side depends only on system two. This is the energy in system two at equilibrium. So uh, we have that the equilibrium is um, given by uh, equating two quantities or well, the same quantity in system one and the same quantity in system two. So this quantity is going to play a very important role. And actually, we are going to see that this is this is um, this is going to be the temperature. We will define this as one over the temperature. Now it's worth it to comment on how the entropy depends on the energy. We didn't say anything. We did, we just mentioned that uh, the entropy is a function of uh, energy and uh, other parameters and that it is maximum at equilibrium. Well, um, entropy can be an increasing function or a decreasing function, but when you go to the to statistical mechanics and you, uh, you find a macroscopic interpretation of entropy and, and, and its properties, you find that uh, in, in most, except in very strange cases, the entropy is an increasing function of the energy. So this is going to be the slope, this is going to be positive, and this is going to be positive. And now this equation has a kind of a very um, uh, uh, intuitive interpretation, which is how how much energy do I have in system one and system two? Well, if, if, if energy flows from system one to system two, then the entropy of two increases and the entropy of one decreases and the other way around. So there is a, whenever you, you you transfer energy from it, from one to two, the entropy of these two systems will decrease and increase, no? And uh, because uh, um, entropy is an increasing function of the energy, so this this equation is telling you when this transfer reaches some kind of balance where the, the when when the when there is no um, the entropy cannot increase if you uh, if energy flows from one to the other. Notice that this derivative is telling you how the entropy of a system increases with the energy. So, uh, and this uh, equilibrium is reached when these two derivatives are equal. So, these derivatives play a very important role because they are telling us uh, when the system is in equilibrium. So, it's worth it to give them a name. And of course, the name is associated with the index that uh, tells you when the when when two systems are in equilibrium, and this is the temperature. So we define temperature as this. And the previous equation uh, that the two derivatives are equal in equilibrium tells you that the equilibrium condition, and this is nothing but this is condition is equal to the imposing that the two temperatures are equal. So uh, you see that uh, this is this is impressive that just with uh, one assumption which is that there is a function which is uh, um, maximum at equilibrium this is not really an assumption this is just trying to code the problem of characterizing equilibrium into a single function plus additivity, and this is the very big assumption. Uh, with these two assumptions, we uh, reach this important um, result that uh, two systems uh, reach equilibrium when the temperatures are equal, and the temperatures are defined in terms of the entropy at the energy like that. Uh, as I said before, the entropy is in, main, in most uh, systems an increasing function of the energy so this temperature is positive always although there are some strange cases where the temperature could be the absolute temperature could be negative but we will not um, uh, discuss this these systems and you can say why is defined like one over t well actually if you think of temperature in historical terms um mm, Temperature, uh, there was not a, a, a fundamental definition of temperature. Temperature was just a kind of empirical 
um, uh, magnitude in the Celsius scale or the Fahrenheit scale that assigns in a conventional way uh, temperature to some property of, uh, of a system like the dilatation, for instance. Uh, it was only with ideal gases that uh, absolute temperature was defined in a more fundamental way, but not so fundamental because also depended on a very on a specific system, which is, a, is an ideal gas. So really to justify the definition, we, one should know the entropy of an ideal gas, which is something that we are not going to discuss here. But just uh, think of the temperature as something that must be equal in equilibrium. And if it is not equal, if, if T1 is bigger than T2, this means that uh, uh, energy will flow from system 1 to system 2, not because the temperature are different, but because this, uh, this uh, entropy will increase by by transferring energy until the temperatures are equal so we see that uh, the flow of heat from a hot uh, uh, system to a cold system is just an attempt of the whole global system to maximize the entropy in in thermodynamics uh, instead of using this chain rule and and doing the max optimization as, as I presented before, it is usually more convenient to use differentials. So the differential of, of a function is just the partial derivatives multiplied by the, the, vari the differential of the variables. So uh, in this case, ds1 is just the derivative of es1 with respect to e1, which is t1 over t1 times the e1 and so on. Why we use these uh, differentials? Well, because sometimes these uh, constraints between variables of the system are much easier to express in terms of differentials. For instance, that the, that the total energy is constant means that dE1, the change in energy of uh, system 1, is equal to minus dE2. So if one applies this constraint, then uh, can get rid of the of d2 which is not an independent of d1 so now everything is expressed in terms of the change in a single variable d1 which is a free variable and now this if i want the total differential to be zero this must be zero so i get again that t1 is equal to t2 so this this uh, method of the differential this is very nice because it's much easier than the um, than the calculating derivatives but it has also created a lot of confusion because when you study processes you use the same uh, mathematical um, tool but in that case when you study processes these differentials are real differentials i mean it's it's the change when you have a process like a compression or an expansion is the change in energy or the change of entropy in a, in a given stage of the process so this makes thermodynamics more even more confusing because you are using the same mathematics for two very different uh, problems one is the problem of maximizing a function the entropy and the second is to calculate changes along a process by uh, dividing the process in infinitesimal uh, sub-processes, in infinitesimal changes. So uh, uh, please, uh, in some books they call these virtual change, virtual differentials and real differentials, but this is a real mess. Here, differentials are just uh, a tool, mathematical tool to calculate derivatives and to calculate the maximum of a function, like making this equal to zero, okay? So uh, this uh, game of uh, systems exchanging energy can be extended to system exchanging other uh, conserved quantities. So the typical uh, case of gases is that you have two gases and they can exchange energy through a wall. If the, the wall can move, then the, the, the volume of, of, of gas one can also be transferred to volume two to system two, which is nothing but moving the piston, and also particles, if the wall is, uh, has some permeability and, and particles can jump, uh, particles can jump from one to the other. 
or in this case when you when we say n1 goes to n2 this can also be a, a, a chemical reaction or the change of conformation in a protein or ionization and system one can be neutral atoms and system two can be ionized atoms so this doesn't mean a spatial as we mentioned before this doesn't mean a spatial change through a wall or something like that sometimes it's like that for instance in the in biophysics this this type of membrane where you have ions that can be inside can can go through the membrane this is also important but this is but anyone going to into this this exchange of particles can be very general so how we solve the, uh, the the problem of finding equilibrium here the two the three variables are e1 v1 and one they are nouns so we want to know if if the system the global system is in a, isolated we want to know the value of these three magnitudes in equilibrium and we uh, proceed as before we let's use the differential uh, of the entropy the, the the trick of the differentials so we have the differential of of the entropy of e1 uh, plus the differential of uh, d2 now we have constraints because all these quantities are um, conserved so we have that energy is conserved so the change in, in e1 is minus the change in e2 the volume is conserved and the number of particles is conserved so uh, although here i have six variables not the differentials of six variables only three are independent so i use these constraints to eliminate the ones that are not independent or to eliminate three of them and then i use for instance the e2 equal minus the e1 and group the terms and i get this and i play the same game with volume and with the number of particles and now these three quantities are independent so the coefficient accompanying these differentials must be zero this is like uh, when you calculate the the maximum of a multivariate function is to um, you have to make zero the gradient the, the, th the three components of the gradient so these are the the three components of the gradient of the entropy with respect to uh, energy volume and number of particles in the system one so we get if this is zero we get that the three quantities must be zero and we have the same result as before here we have t1 equal to t2 and here we have something this this is equal to this and each of these quantities are uh, referred to system this quantity refers to system one this quantity refers to system two and the same for the number of particles this quantity refers to number to system one and this to system two so the three equilibrium conditions are expressed as the equality between two magnitudes one of system one and of system two so it is worth it to define to give names to these quantities we have done this with the energy this is the temperature and uh, the derivative of, of the entropy with the step to volume is associated to um, exchange of volume or in other words to the motion of the of the piston so it will be related with the pressure and uh, we define the pressure in thermodynamics like that the derivative of s with respect to volume times the temperature and this quantity is also important and we define the we call it chemical potential divided by the temperature and the equilibrium is just that these magnitudes must be equal in the three in the two systems so uh, when we have this equality we call it thermal equilibrium if t1 is different from t2 heat or energy will flow from system one to system two if the pressures are not uh, equal uh, the piston will move until it will reach an, uh, a position where the the two pressures are equal and we call this mechanical equilibrium and the same with the chemical potential if the chemical potentials are different there will be a flow of particles from system one to system two or the way around until they reach equal uh, values and this is called chemical equilibrium 
and then we have the main uh, 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 magnitudes in thermodynamics, which is temperature, pressure, and chemical equilibrium. Here, uh, people can say, hey, uh, this is very nice, but uh, pressure is something that we know from mechanics. We, this pressure is not a concept that it is just appears just in thermodynamics, but it is force divided by area. So uh, and here you define pressure as uh, this formula. So uh, you can, it's not like temperature that was conventional, pressure was not conventional. I mean, the mechanical um, definition of pressure. So to convince you that this uh, definition is compatible with uh, the mechanical definition of pressure, uh, let me uh, give you this very nice example. Here we have a, a gas in a box and there is a piston and the piston has a mass um, and there is a gravitational field. So, um, and the system is isolated, so the piston will move until it will reach equilibrium. So the problem is what is the equilibrium value of this Z, the height of the piston. And the way to proceed is as we have done before. So the total, uh, we have to calculate the entropy and the entropy will be the entropy of the gas which uh, let's assume that depend on the energy on the volume the energy of the volume it could depend on other quantities like the number of particles or i don't know if, uh, some interaction between particles or whatever but these these things uh, don't change the only thing that change here is the energy of the gas the only variables are the gas the the, the energy of the gas because if the piston moves down this means that the potential energy of the piston is transferred to the system and uh, the volume also changes so we will uh, the only variables that uh, are important here is the energy of the piston which is the total energy of the system minus the energy of the piston which is the potential energy of the piston and then the volume and these are the only two variables volume and energy which are important we should use additivity and add here the, the the entropy of the piston but the entropy of the piston the piston only changes its position uh, maybe it has some entropy because it has it is composed by molecules and so on but the, we will assume that they are this uh, the internal structure of the piston doesn't change the only change is the the, the height of the piston of course we are always uh, talking about idealizations. Uh, the, the, this will have a temperature and so on, but uh, an idealization is uh, is somehow to only focus on the relevant variables. And here the only relevant variables are the, the height of the piston and the entropy of the piston does not depend on the height. So we can just, uh, uh, in, because the only thing we want to do is to maximize this function and to find how this entropy depends on Z, on the height of the piston, then we don't need to add the entropy of the piston. Well, we could add it, but it is just a constant. And uh, the volume is the area of the piston. This is the, the, the section of the box, the piston, times the height of the piston. This is the volume occupied by the gas, the volume of this container here. So now let's calculate the equilibrium state. In other words, what is the value of Z reached at equilibrium? And we proceed as before. We follow the main statement of thermodynamics, which is that equilibrium maximizes the entropy. So we calculate the derivative of the, so let's do it uh, using derivatives and not differentials. We could do it with differentials as well. So we calculate the derivative of the entropy with respect to Z. But Z appears here twice, appears in the first argument and appears in the second argument. So we have to use the chain rule and then the derivative will be the derivative of the, of the entropy of the gas with respect to its argument times the derivative of the argument with respect to z which is minus mg and now 
applying the chain rule, we have to add also the derivative with respect to volume times the derivative of the argument with respect to z, which is a, the area of the piston. So this is the derivative of the total entropy of the global system with respect to the height of the piston. This must be, well, we can write this using the definitions of the previous blackboard. This is one over the temperature. Of course, the temperature will depend on all these things, on Z and so on. But this is just uh, uh, a way of calling. But uh, all this information is coded in, in, in the temperature. So we have minus mg the temperature. And here, if I use the definition that I gave before, this is the pressure divided by the temperature. Now, at equilibrium, this must be zero. So what we get is that uh, we can cancel the temperature in the two and we get that pressure times area is equal to mass times g which is the acceleration of gravity or in other words the force exerted by the gas because pressure is the pressure that the gas exerts on the piston is equal to the weight of the piston so what we have is just the balance of forces we have the weight of the piston i mean a balance of forces in the piston so what are the forces that the piston feels the piston feels the weight because it is in the gravitational field mg and also feels a force due to the gas which is pressure times area and when these two forces are equal the piston uh, stops and we reach equilibrium. So you see that the definition of uh, pressure that we have introduced before is per compatible with the mechanical definition of temperature as force divided by area. Okay, let's move on and um, now uh, I've introduced entropy and I've introduced uh, pressure, uh, chemical potential and temperature just in the context of solving um, the problem of what is the equilibrium state in, in an isolated system. So uh, other concepts important in thermodynamics like free energy appear by solving the same problem. In this case, uh, we are going to solve the problem of finding the equilibrium state of a system which is not isolated, but it is in, cost, in contact with a thermal bath. What is the thermal bath? A thermal bath is an environment which is only uh, where, where the system only exchanges energy. Uh, you can also ex exchange with environment particles or volume. In this case, they are called, usually they are called reservoirs particle reservoir volume reservoirs and so on but let's consider the the, the simplest case of uh, energy reservoir where you have a, an environment and the only important thing of the environment is first that it is in equilibrium and second that it is characterized by a temperature and that it the only thing that the environment does is to uh, uh, transfer energy to the system or receive energy from the system so the total thing is isolated, the total system plus bath is isolated. Here I will use this, this notation B for uh, the magnitudes, the subscript B for the magnitudes of the bath and no subscript for the system because at the end of the day I want to characterize the system and, and forget about the bath. Uh, this is so, um, and this is what we are going to do in this, in this blackboard. So the global system is isolated, so we can apply the equilibrium condition that we have seen before, that the entropy is maximum. So let, let's apply the, the differential uh, um, tool, the differential tree, the trick of the differentials. So we have that the, the total entropy is the entropy of the bath plus the entropy of the system. This is additivity again, and now we calculate the differential. And since the bath, the, and, and in equilibrium, this is going to be equal to zero. The bath is characterized by a temperature. The bath, the only thing that the bath does is to uh, exchange energy with the system. So the only change of entropy in the bath is due to the 
energy that the bath exchanges with the system. This is again a kind of idealization, but it's a useful idealization um, that you have environments and the only thing that uh, changes in the environment is the energy that it receives. The, the, otherwise, the environment is passive, it's at equilibrium. So the entropy of the bath only changes because this it's its energy changes and as we said as we uh, saw before the the entropy when the when only the energy changes is just the EB divided by t and this is the entropy of the system which can be very complicated or can be anything so this is the total uh, change of entropy in the universe and now since the total system is the global system is isolated the total energy is constant so we have the typical constraint that db is equal to minus de the change of energy in the bath is minus the change of energy in the system so now we have this and this is very nice because the bath does not appear here except for the temperature. So all the effect of the bath is coded in its temperature. And now we can uh, calculate, or we can uh, put everything this together. This is because, I mean, for historical reasons, it's better to write it like that. And we have that the total entropy of the universe, the change in the total entropy of the universe, is minus the change of this quantity in the system and this is a quantity in the system the only uh, all the effect of the bath is 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 encoded in this number the temperature this is going to be a very important quantity so uh we call this the free energy e minus ts and we can write the total change in the entropy of the universe as minus the change in free energy divided by the temperature in the system and this just refers to the system because temperature is supposed to be constant here in this we have a bath which has a constant temperature and this is called free energy or Helmholtz free energy and now what is the equilibrium condition well if the equilibrium condition of the global system is that this is maximum and any change in entropy of the universe is minus change in free energy but because of this sign now the equilibrium condition is going to be that the equilibrium is the state that minimizes the free energy and this is the uh, real interest of introducing free energy of course there are other uh, mm, other applications of free energy but this is the main uh, uh, this is how free energy appears it helps you to compute the change of entropy in the whole universe when a system is in contact with the thermal path Okay, let me write here again. When I have a system in contact with a thermal bath, the equilibrium condition is no longer to maximize the entropy, but to minimize the free energy. So it is as important as entropy, free energy, because it tells you how to calculate, how to solve the main problem. What is the equilibrium state of a system? So the equilibrium state of a system is the one that maximizes entropy if the system is isolated and is the one that minimizes the uh, free energy if the system is in contact with the thermal bath at a given temperature t. Notice these uh, two uh, possible limits. When the system is in contact with the thermal bath ve at very low temperature, let's say t equals zero, then this term disappears and minimizing free energy it means is equivalent to minimizing the energy or or the system goes to the ground state this is something that probably uh, all you know but let us 
uh, interpret this result in the light of this definition of free energy and in the light of the fact that the free energy computes the total change of entropy in the universe. So what is happening with you have a system when you have a bath at very low temperatures, remember that the temperature is 1 over t is the derivative, is the slope of the entropy as a function of the energy. So at zero temperatures means that this uh, plot, entropy versus energy, is very steep, is almost vertical. So what happens in this case is that if the system dissipates a very small amount of energy to the bath then the entropy of the bath will increase by a lot because temperature is zero so this is almost infinity so the best thing that the whole system can do to increase the entropy of the universe of the universe the best thing that the whole system can do to increase the entropy of the universe is to dissipate all the energy of the system into the bath and this is why at t zero or close to zero uh, a system uh, minimizes the energy or a system goes to the ground state on the other hand if the temperature is very large then this is the dominant term so the free energy is minus Ts and minimizing free energy is equivalent to maximizing S. So when the system is in contact with a very uh, hot bath, the, what happens is that uh, if, this is, if T is large, the slope is almost zero. So it doesn't matter, you can, you can put energy into the bath, but the entropy of, of the bath doesn't increase. So for the system is not worth it to, to dissipate energy, it will, uh, uh, it will behave as an isolated system, so it will try, the system will try to maximize the entropy. So you see that uh, the free energy uh, expresses this compromise. Uh, I said before that the entropy of a system usually is an increasing function of the energy, so the, the system can absorb energy from the bath or can uh, dissipate energy into the bath. And the free energy tells you what this, of these two possibilities are better. Uh, if I want to minimize the free energy, I can minimize the energy, but then I have to dissipate to the bath. And then this, uh, the bath will increase its entropy. And the other way around, if the system tries to maximize its entropy, it, it has to take energy from the bath, but then this has some, uh, the, the entropy of the bath decreases. So this compromise between the entropy of the system and the entropy of the bath, this is precisely encoded in the free energy. I think this is the the best way of introducing free energy because it's telling you really that um, what is the effect. I think this is the best way of introducing free energy as a, a way of computing the change of entropy in the universe in any transformation. But the free energy also has some uh, interesting mathematical properties and it's a very useful tool not only for calculating equilibrium states uh, when for systems in contact with thermal bath but in for other purposes and mathematically for instance it's very interesting that here uh, before in, in, in this scenario the temperature is constant so we have uh, consider free energy for constant temperature but you can calculate also the differential of free energy in a general situation when the temperature can change as well. Uh, in this case, if we use uh, the differential of the entropy, remember that it is the partial derivative of entropy with respect to energy is 1 over t, with respect to volume is p over t, with respect to number of particles is minus mu over t. So we can write 
the differential of entropy like that. And if we uh, include this here, then DE uh, cancels. And then we get minus SDT and these terms with uh, this T cancels with this T as well. And then we have minus PDB plus mu dn. So if you consider as the variables of free energy, the number of particles, the volume and the temperature, then you see that these are the partial derivatives or in other words, uh, the entropy is be this derivative. The pressure will be the derivative of the free energy with respect to volume with a minus sign at temperature and number of particles constant. And the same for the chemical potential. And these are also very useful expressions to calculate pressure and chemical potential in, in systems. Uh, but this is this is also um, uh, a problem of thermodynamics. We started with this uh, question of why nobody understands thermodynamics. It's also because uh, thermodynamics is uh, it has a lot of basic uh, assumptions on the physical world, and most of them based on uh, very strong idealizations of how we describe reality. But it has also a lot of mathematical tricks. And uh, actually, all these mathematical tricks are necessary because thermodynamics is always playing the game where uh, variables become fixed parameters and fixed parameters can become variables in different situations. So you have a bunch of uh, magnitudes, like for instance, we define temperature as the derivative of S with respect to the energy. But uh, so it is, it, one would say, ah, it's a, it's a secondary quantity because it's just the derivative of uh, a function, which is the entropy. But in, in the laboratory, it turns out that sometimes the temperature is, is much easier to control than the entropy of the energy. So uh, um, you have to express quantities in sometimes in, in, in as a function of some variables, sometimes as a function of another other variables. And for this uh, game, mathematical game, these differentials are very important. And this notation that you probably know in thermodynamics that when you make a derivative, you have to specify uh, what are the variables that are kept constant in this partial di differentiation. But this, as I said, this is just uh, uh, mathematical tricks that are common in, in, in thermodynamics. But I hope that with these two ideas of characterizing equilibrium, I've um, given you uh, an idea of what is the basic, th the basic uh, task of thermodynamics and how entropy and free energy and temperature and pressure and chemical potential appear as uh, magnitudes that help to solve this problem of finding the equilibrium state of a system. First, isolated systems. Second, systems in contact with the thermal bath. Okay, once we have solved the first problem of characterizing the equilibrium state, we can try to address the second task, analyzing processes. So I'm going to be very brief with this, but I don't want to, I want to connect all that we have seen in this video with these main textbooks of or many of these textbooks on thermodynamics that focus on uh, on processes. So the idea is that you have a system uh, and uh, let's talk about first about uh, isothermal processes where the system is in contact with the thermal bath and you modify some parameters of the system and then as a, as a consequence the system evolves and then exchanges energy with the bath and this energy exchange with the bath is called heat in the modern uh, convention of science heat is considered positive when it goes from the bath to the system. But of course, in this manipulation of the parameters of the system, I'm also introducing some energy or extracting some energy when I, I move a piston, when I switch on a field, when I switch off a field and so on. And this is a energy that uh, we call work. Although we will see that the main distinction between work and heat is that heat comes from 
a bath so the entropy of the bath will change because of this uh, heat whereas uh, the work doesn't uh, is not accompanied by any change of entropy in the environment and uh, when you have a process the main uh, or the most basic uh, equation is the conservation of energy which is that all the energy inputs work is also positive when it goes to the from the from the environment to the system uh, it is uh, all this energy input increases the energy of the system this is the first law although really in in the 19th century it was necessary to introduce this law because people didn't know what was heat or what was the internal energy of a system but nowadays uh, we know that uh, when that energy conservation of energy is a, is a property of Newtonian mechanics or or um, uh, quantum mechanics and that there is no need to introduce this as a new result because it's just uh, the conservation of energy of the energy of all the particles that compose a system as I said before uh, what is the difference between heat and work the main difference is that heat implies a change in the entropy of the uni of the of the environment in this case since heat is the the energy that flows from the bath to the system uh, this flow or this heat implies a, a, a change in the in the entropy of the bath which is minus t delta sp So if we can calculate the change of entropy uh, in the universe during this process, and these are not these are not differential, these are real changes. What happens in the universe when you change a parameter, when you compress a gas, or when you uh, expand the gas, and uh, and the entropy of the universe in, in, will change uh, because the entropy of the system changes and the entropy of the bath changes. But the change in the entropy of the bath is uh, minus q divided by t so now i have that the entropy of the universe in this process i can characterize it just is a little bit what we have done with the free energy is characterized by this uh, uh, magnitudes which refer to the system delta s refers to the system q refers to the system because it's the energy that it goes from the system to the bath and t is the only parameter that uh, remains from the bath let's say and now we can apply the first law. The heat is uh, delta E minus W. So if I uh, put everything uh, in the uh, numerator and the denominator is T, I have T delta S minus delta E plus W. And here you see that because everything is at fixed temperature, this is again delta E minus T delta S is free energy. So if I multiply by T, I get that T times the total entropy of the, the, the change in entropy in the universe is W minus delta F. Here it's pertinent to introduce the second law as a postulate. So this means that in, in an isothermal process, work. is always bigger than delta f so if delta f is is positive this means that uh, the the free energy of the final state is higher than the initial state so i'm increasing the free energy if i'm increasing the free energy of a system i need to perform work i need to give energy to the system if I want to increase its free energy. On the other hand, if I have a state with high free energy and I implement a process where the free energy decreases, then delta F is negative. So this means that the work can be negative. And this means that I can extract work. So 
if I have a high free energy state, by decreasing the free energy, I can extract work. And this is the basic idea of motors, chemical motors, thermal motors, and so on. Well, thermal motors is different because you need two thermal baths, but the idea is also the same. And here, uh, I will stop here because from now on, uh, the, may, the most of the textbooks are okay. You can uh, you can analyze processes and so on. Although this simple analysis of how the entropy of the universe changes in a process, in an isothermal process, and uh, how this change is related with the free energy is not in all the textbooks. And I think it's the simplest case where you can apply the first law and the second law and, and derive some interesting um, results. For instance, uh, to, to finish, if I have a cycle, then delta F, which is the free energy of the final minus the free energy of the initial uh, states is zero. And then this means that work must be positive. So I can never extract work from a single thermal path. But as I said, this is a good point to, to finish because uh, I think with these ideas, especially with this first task of uh, thermodynamics of characterizing equilibrium states, you can go to this historical approach based on the first law and second law, but with uh, this basis, understand better the whole topic of uh, equilibrium thermodynamics.